Hi everyone again. Let's start the question of the day. Good news or bad news? Which one do you want to hear first? The good or the bad? Okay, majority rules. Let's go with the bad news. So what's the bad news? Well, unfortunately, the bad news is our city is still in phase one of COVID-19. So most of Ontario is opening up, but we haven't been allowed to open up yet. So that means we'll have to wait a little while before we get our hair cut and before you can go to your favorite cafe or restaurant. But we're making progress because the infection numbers are going down and we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, now the good news. What is the good news? The good news that is that our social circles have expanded. So now we can meet in groups of 10, social distancing. So that is a good thing. And how about camping? Provincial camping is now opened, but only for you guys who are hardcore backcountry campers who can rough it. And what about churches? We've been given the okay to open at 30% of our capacity, but we are gonna take this slowly. We're not gonna rush into this. So we are gonna be taking our time and making the good decisions that are helpful for everyone. So let's be in constant prayer for our church leaders. We want to do this as carefully as we can and as wisely as we can. So seeing light at the end of this tunnel gives us hope and it has been a long tunnel, but I feel very blessed because of you. Uh, my heart is full of thanksgiving because I have seen your faith grow and develop over this time. I've seen your solidarity, even though we can't meet together. And you have been so committed in meeting and praying for each other and for serving for those who are in the most need. And this has been really God's answer for his work in your life. So as we listen and watch the news, there continues to be a lot of sad and tragic news. And the things that are happening around the world has been quite depressing for many people. And I've seen this affect two of my friends in particular. One of my friends told me that because of his reduced work hours, he's been pretty much at home and he spends pretty much the entire day sitting in front of the TV and watching news. And he has admitted to me that the more he watches, the more angry and the more cynical he's becoming. And another friend, he's in a very similar situation. My friend Thomas, who I used to mountain bike with, he shared this on the Facebook post. I'm not feeling well. For the last three or four months, I've been consuming news media from around the world for five or six hours a day. Day in and day out, it's all been bad news. Death, destruction, mass COVID graves in Brazil, in New York City, in Iran human rights abuses, mass flood, and water shortages caused by the pandemic, and the list goes on and on. For the last three weeks, I've been having weird random chest and body pain. I know what I must do to get back to health. This is not an excuse, and take responsibility for this. So the news is very overwhelming, and I feel for them. And in honesty, it can happen to you, to me, to everyone. And once we get stuck into this routine and we're bombarded by all these negative messages, it will pull us down. And it's kind of like being around negative people. 
and I think we all know some negative people, and you know what it feels like when you're around them, nothing is right with life. They're always pessimistic about something, and they're cynical of people, and they are just draining to be around, and it's no fun to be around them. So negative people and bad situations, they can really pull us down into the spiral and really dampen our spirits. So what do we do? What can we do in situations like this and how do we respond? So again, I want to be as practical as I can to offer you something that will help your situation, that will help your spiritual life. And you might know of someone who are like my two friends, or you yourself are beginning, beginning to feel that you're entering into this dark space. So what does Christ call us to do? What does he offer to us to bring goodness to this world? First of all, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, you have Christ in you. You have the light of God with you, in you, and all around you. And don't forget that. Even before you even noticed that he was in your life, he was already walking with you. And through the Holy Spirit, he constantly walks with you. He guides you. He empowers you. He leads you. And there has never, ever been a time that he is far from you. Here in Psalm 23rd, the most cherished, the most favorite psalm of the entire Bible, this is what it says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And these words, they had flowed from the heart of King David during a very dark and painful time in his life. He was going through doom and gloom. He was going through chaos and hardship and all of the stuff seeped into his life. And he felt as if death was right at his doorstep. And this is the scripture that we turn to during funerals or when someone is approaching death. And as humans, we all go through these dark times, these moments which we call doom and gloom. And it's a time that many people are feeling right now. Maybe some of your friends are going through this, and maybe you feel that you're going through a dark valley of loneliness. But Psalm 23 is not really about doom and gloom. It is a psalm of God's comfort and hope. And David says this, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So David reminds us that we don't need to be afraid. We don't have to become despondent. God is with us all the time, and his presence gives us strength and comfort. So remember, remember this. He is with you every moment. It only takes but a second to invite him close to you again. Maybe a quick prayer. Maybe pray the Jesus prayer. Jesus, have mercy on me. Let's look at John 8, 12. 12. This is what Jesus says. It's quite extraordinary. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, this is a very bold and powerful claim. Jesus doesn't just point to the light. He doesn't say, there's the way out. No, he says, I am the light. I am the light. And this is powerful. And what do we usually associate light with? When we say that someone walks in the light, what are we saying? Well, we're saying that that guy's a good guy. So light is universally understood as a metaphor for goodness. And light is also the sort, source of life. The light that comes from the sun allows us to sustain life on this earth. Light is also the source of truth and freedom. So when Jesus says he is the light, it means he's the source of all goodness, of all life, of justice and freedom. If I may, and if I can, use a Star Wars metaphor to illustrate it. Jesus wasn't just a Jedi master. He wasn't just a Jedi who wielded the force, nor was he even the Grand Master who trained all of the Jedis. Even though his disciples may call him master, Jesus would have probably said, I am the force. 
I am the force of the universe. So Jesus is the very source of light and life and goodness and truth. And so that means that Christ really is the most important thing that our world needs. There is no darkness that is so dark that his light cannot enter. His light is able to penetrate the darkest of the dark. He will penetrate even the thickest prison walls and he will enter into the most lonesome hearts. He's there in every hospital ward and he's present with you right now as you're listening. Since you follow Jesus, then you have the light and life of Christ right within you. And that light that you have is the most useful, the most powerful thing that you can offer. So that means there is something that you can do. You have something that you can give, that you can offer to this world, especially for those who are in dark places. You can bring your light to those situations where there is pain and where there's negativity. And there are situations where you can turn a negative situation into a positive one. You can offer a kind word, maybe an encouragement, or perhaps you just be with your friend. You may not be able to take away the harm and the pain, but you can offer your friendship and your very presence. And here is a very practical verse from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And Paul is so practical here. So let's say you find yourself in a negative situation. Let's say you come into conflict. It's a sharp disagreement with someone and it gets very heated. And all of a sudden that person insults you. They say very harmful and hurtful words. What do you do? How do you normally respond to things like this? Well, of course, the temptation for most of us is to fight back, to retaliate, to give some choice words to them. Every bone in your body wants to hurt them back. But I say to you, resist. You must resist those urges. With the strength that God gives you, resist the urge to take revenge instead do good. Do good. And doing good in this instant doesn't mean that you're going to be their friend and their buddy buddy. Instead, you take what they throw at you, all that meanness, all that darkness, all that anger, you take it in and you transform it. You turn that negative into a positive. You respond as Christ would respond in that situation, making it a positive, a good thing. So what could be the positive thing here? Well, one of the positive things is that you have not acted like the other person. You acted like Christ. You chose not to engage or to go into that dark place, but instead you stayed calm and in control of your emotions. It sounds like a difficult thing to do, and sometimes it really is, but it is not out of your reach. You are able to do this because you have Christ in you. You have within you the power and the strength that comes from Christ. And as you practice this, this becomes your spiritual exercise, which we've talked about. You are moving forward in your spiritual life as you're able to do good and to grow your virtues. And of course, the opposite of this is to fall into temptation, to retaliate. And when you do this, you have crossed you have gone into that dark side. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, darkness can not drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So we, might, we must fight evil with good. The light must prevail in your life. And you always have a choice to make when negative things come your way. Remember last week, we looked at some examples from the show, What Would You Do? And we saw these so social situations of injustice and prejudice. And in those situations, it's very important that you speak up to defend the weak and the vulnerable and to do good. In those situations, it's good 
to be proactive and to turn the negative into a positive for the week. But then there are other times. There are times when the most simple response, the most godly response is to say nothing. Yes, say nothing at all and just walk away. And this isn't a sign of apathy, nor is it uncaring, because there are those situations where closing that door to a bad habit, to temptations, that's the best thing you can do. It's like closing my yard gate so that the groundhog doesn't get in or a wild animal doesn't come in. So practically speaking, this can simply mean turning off the news. Stop watching those things that really drag you on and don't let curiosity lead you to those places which will only bring you down. For my two friends who found themselves in a dark place, neither of them are Christians and one of them is a very good friend of mine. So I gave him a call last week and this was an, an evangelistic call because that's not what he needed. And I'm not a therapist so I can't offer him any counseling but what I can offer him is my friendship. I can listen. I can listen to his struggles and see how he's been managing. And I talked to him for a few hours, but it was a very small thing that I did. I was prayerfully listening to him, and I hoped that in some small way, I was able to offer him something, maybe just a ray of light to help him on his path. I prayerfully hoped that by being with him and that by my presence, that somehow I can bring him encouragement. There are times when you are called to enter a person's darkness, to walk with them in their negativity. It may be only just a few steps, but those few steps, you bring the very presence of God into their life. You should not expect to solve things or solve their problems. Only God can do that. But what you are offering is yourself the presence of Christ with them. So as you bear some of that burden for them, as you take some of that negativity, you are doing good. You are converting some of that negativity and changing it into something that is good. And again, this is part of exercising your spiritual muscles. As you care, as you grow your virtues, you will grow in mercy and humility. And you are doing what Christ would do working out your salvation. So let's look at the last verse here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 to 24 here. He never answered back when insulted. When he suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried the load of our sin in his own body when he died on the cross so that he can be finished with sin and live a good life from now on. For his wounds, we, for his wounds have healed ours. So here Jesus gives us the perfect example of humility and forgiveness. He endured the darkest, most oppressive darkness, sin. He took on the sin and death of all humanity. And he endured insults and the false accusations that were hurled at him. And yet, he said nothing. He said nothing to defend himself. Instead, what did he do? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So as they were crucifying him, he asked the Father to forgive the evil that was done to him. And how could he possibly do that? Love and forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is never as simple as just saying, it's all right, it doesn't really matter. Well, you might actually say that, but there is a tremendous cost involved to be able to say this. Forgiveness is extremely costly. Pastor Tim Keller had put it in a way that makes so much sense to us. This is what he says. The essence of forgiveness is absorbing pain instead of giving it. The essence of forgiveness is to absorb pain instead of giving it. Isn't this an amazing way to see forgiveness? Sin always causes pain. 
when someone slights you, when they lie, when they betray you, you will feel deep pain. And when this happens, our natural human tendency is to do what? We have the urge to get even, right? When things are evened out, they pay. You make them feel some of your pain. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is when you choose to pay. Yep, you choose to pay by absorbing the pain. And here Keller reminds us that forgiveness is a way of suffering. Forgiveness is a way of suffering. And it makes sense. Jesus' forgiveness is available to you and me because he suffered for the sins of humanity. Look at it this way. Let's say someone wrongs you. Let's say your friend, they damage your, your, your headphones and it's going to cost a hundred bucks to replace them. And there's no solution to this without a hundred dollar debt and someone has to suffer something, right? Your friend can choose to bite the bullet and suffer the hundred dollar bill. Or you say to them, that's okay, you forgive them. So now you suffer the cost and loss of having to replace that yourself. So you can see forgiveness is costly. And as a Christian, we are called to absorb the pain so that healing can happen. And this is hard, but this is the way that will deepen our spiritual life and the work of God in your life. So as we come to a close today, let me end with another silly illustration, which might help some of you. Since I brought up Star Wars, let's talk about Kung Fu. I'm a long time Kung Fu action movie fan, and I watched quite a bit since I was a kid. And pretty much every film follows the same tropes and cliches. In these movies, we would be introduced to the old grandmaster, the Sifu, and he's usually hidden away in some mountain, cave, or in a monastery. And the Sifu has reached the pinnacle of his art. He has mastered the deepest secrets of Qigong, or life energy. So he's super powerful. And of course, he's being sought after by all the young warriors who want to learn the secrets of fighting. But when they find him, he's no longer interested in combat and fighting. He's retired. Instead, he now uses his Qigong for good, for meditation. So at some point in the movie, one of the young heroes, he sustains a lethal blow during a battle with the boss. He's near death. And the only way to save his life is, how can he be saved? Yes, only the Sifu has the skill to save his life. And how will he do this? With his Qigong. So the Sifu places his hands on the dying man and he summons his Qi and he begins to absorb his pain and his injury. But as he does this, he suffers, he's weakened, he's drained, but to the benefit and to the survival and healing of this young man. And of course, the movie ends and the young man becomes the new Sifu. Okay, so there it is. You go and do the same. We're hardly Sifus, but you and I, we have the master healer. He is in us and with us. He has healed you and you have his light within you so that when life throws us in darkness, when someone is lost in the dark, you have the ability to come alongside of them. And as you walk alongside of them, you begin to share God's light that brings hope and healing. So let us always show our light of Christ so that they may have hope. Amen.